All right, everybody. So uh, welcome to another one in the series about um, IFR and multi-flying. Uh, the lesson that we're going to be talking about today is it should be fairly brief. It's just talking really about the uh, the basic procedures for multi-flying, specifically talking about uh, how to operate the aircraft within the circuit context and uh, engine failures uh, in flight. So I'm doing a screen share right now with the, um, what I basically try to draw here is a runway with a circuit pattern on it. And we're going to talk about the normal procedures that you would use in a circuit. Now, um, during one of the, I want to say the first two or three lessons in the, the multi-syllabus, it's good for us to go up and do a, a lesson, just only multi-circuits, you know, spend about an hour doing six, seven touch and goes, whatever the case may be, to get yourself comfortable with the, uh, the way the aircraft is going to handle. Normally, we don't do circuits right off the first lesson because uh, it moves a lot faster than you might be used to. And uh, we want to get you comfortable with how the aircraft handles under normal circumstances before we kind of push you in the, the faster moving environment of the circuit. But let's talk about what you would normally expect to see in a, a circuit here. So this is my attempt to draw a runway with the a right hand circuit pattern, the standard. And uh, let's talk about power settings, speeds and procedures here. So I'm going to be drawing some text in here. So as we take position on the runway, uh, there's no need to ask for a momentary stop. You can basically just roll into position uh, and make sure that you're all set up to go. What I recommend is that before you take position that you have the heading bug uh, on the HSI set for the runway heading and uh, have the uh, HSI needle pointed the same direction. So both heading bug and needle should be pointing at your 12 o'clock position when you roll, uh, when you line up and you roll on the center line. Uh, power setting that we're going to be using for uh, takeoff is anywhere between 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure. And if you have um, and don't be too paranoid about trying to get right up to 40. If it's above 35, that's more than enough to get our power going. There's not an, there's no RPM associated with this. I think it works out to be 26 or 2700 RPM, but just your props should be in the full forward position and the, uh, uh, the manifold pressure uh, between 35 to 40. Uh, if you recall from one of the other lessons, we have a turbocharged engine on this aircraft, so we do not firewall the throttle. It's only about halfway up the throttle quadrant, about a half... Um, uh, halfway for the throttle uh, lever angle, TLA. Uh, with that power setting, the aircraft will accelerate very quickly. You'll feel that you'll push into this seat accelerating motion. And um, uh, as long as you try to keep your eye on the, um, on the center line, keep the aircraft more or less center, that would be good. The one thing I will point out with the, um, the manifold pressure gauge has got two needles on one instrument. So um, when you're bringing the throttles up, there might be uh, a different acceleration of the turbocharger. So one engine might spool up faster than the other engine. And uh, just because the needle that's on the left is lower doesn't mean that's your left engine. So you actually have to look and see which one shows L, which one shows R. And uh, if one is lower or higher, then you have to uh, adjust them as necessary. Uh, that caught me the first time that I was doing a takeoff on this thing. But anyways, uh, we'll set the power for takeoff. Uh, as the aircraft accelerates down the runway at 80 miles per hour is going to be our rotate speed. So I'll put that here, we'll say VR equals 80 miles per hour. Uh, you'll rotate the aircraft and we bring, when it comes to rotating the aircraft, you don't want to pitch up too aggressively, uh, just dash to the horizon because you do want the aircraft to still, still accelerate to 120 miles per hour. So a shallow climb during the first stages is going to be beneficial. If you start pitching back too much, the airspeed's not going to accelerate. And if it, that's where I get a little bit uneasy. If someone's pitching back too far, I'm kind of worried about a uh, potential of a stall. Uh, not that it actually happens because the stall of this aircraft is, is much lower than the rotate speed, but you know, we still want to you know, increase our margins of safety as much as we can. Um, rotate at 80, we will uh, climb out. Actually, I should have done that all in the same text here. Can I go back and adjust that? Select. Yeah, there we go. Uh, unfortunately, it does not look like I can change that. So uh, then we will climb out. Our uh, normal climb speed is going to be, I was about to put VY, but the, the thing about VY in this aircraft is actually 105 uh, miles per hour. But um, for in practice, what we'll end up doing is we'll use a, uh, a normal climb speed of 120. And the purpose for that is if we do exit, if, if we do lose an engine on takeoff, 105 is not only the best rate of it, best rate of climb two engines in this aircraft, it happens to be best rate of climb single engine. So climbing at 120 miles per hour gives you time to react and then pitch for 105 um, and still be able to safely control that aircraft in the climb up. Uh, now, one thing that's going to happen usually between when you rotate and you reach that 120 miles per hour, that's when you will select gear up. Uh, put that here, and we retract the gear um, when the uh, when there's no more sufficient runway remaining for landing. 
Uh, and that kind of brings us to an interesting point that when it comes to uh, before takeoff, we have a takeoff briefing in the, uh, the multi where, and this same for the IFR, but if you're flying a twin engine aircraft, you should always give a, a briefing before takeoff, what you're going to do in a normal takeoff situation, a, uh, an engine failure on the takeoff roll situation and an engine failure in flight. And our go, no go decision point for whether I'm deciding to re-land on the runway if I have an engine failure or continue my takeoff is based on if I have sufficient runway remaining for landing. And for me, the visual reminder of that's the gear up. So the moment that the gear is selected up, if I have an engine failure, it's a, I've committed myself to that takeoff and I'm continuing my departure. Uh, now there is a bit of a speech that you have to study and it should be done word for word. I mean, this is the kind of thing where when it comes to your flight test day with Tom or wherever the flight test examiner happens to be, uh, having that um, speech word for word is a way to impress your examiner before you even get close to the runway. And then if you can do that, you know, like I said, word for word, then the examiner has a little more confidence in your abilities. It's kind of, you know, he knows what he's getting into. If you stumble through your takeoff briefing and it's a little bit mushed here and there, uh, then uh, he's going to start to get, be, he'll perked up and go, okay, maybe I got to be paying a little more attention here. So if you want to do well, I say memorize it. Uh, there's a handout that's associated with that, but I'll give you an example of what the takeoff briefing sounds like. So we say, we're going to do a normal takeoff today. We're going to rotate at 80 miles per hour, climb out at 120, and we will retract the landing gear when there's no more sufficient runway for remaining for landing. Uh, in the event of an engine failure with the gear selected down, I will close both throttles, land straight ahead and come to a stop. In the event of an engine failure with the gear selected up, I will do my engine out drill of control, power, mixture, pitch, power, flaps up, gear up, identify, verify, feather the failed engine, and continue my climb at 105 miles per hour, requesting a circuit in the direction of the good engine. Do you have any questions? Uh, I might have got one or two small words there, but incorrectly, but that's you know 99%. That's pretty damn good. Um, so try to have that memorized as best you can. And uh, that's the reason for that is not just because it's going to impress your examiner, but also that if you do have a real engine failure, then you know, just by automation, just by you know, practicing that so many times, you just go through your own drill that you brief. So you know, do what you brief, brief what you're going to do. Um, so rotate 80, gear up, and then climb out 120. Once the gear is up and retracted, you can then set your climb power. And the climb power for this aircraft is going to be 31.5 uh, inches manifold pressure and 2450 RPM. So we'll set those as soon as the, uh, the aircraft is, um, as the gear selected up. And the reason for that is because you just don't want to overstress the engines. Like at 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure, that engine is producing a lot of thrust. You know, you got a lot of moving pieces, so you don't need to push that engine that hard. Uh, even at 31.5 inches manifold pressure, this aircraft climbs easily more than a thousand feet per minute. If you get a really strong headwind, uh, a really good performance, you can get a, I've had more than 2000 feet per minute climb. So uh, it, it does quite well. <clears throat> and 2450 oh can i change that uh, no i can't i should have wrote written 2450 rpm on that um yeah and what you'll end up doing is uh with the power set you'll bring them down and then it's always throttle first and then props we always say we keep the props ahead so the props is if i'm accelerating the aircraft the props move ahead first before the throttles if I'm decelerating, I move the throt throttles first and then the props. The props always stay in front. So a, a nice, easy way to remember that. Um, what else was I going to say here? Oh, and now, so what's the, um, the gear is up. You set climb power, 31.5 uh, inches manifold pressure. The um, RPM, you might find that in this aircraft, the RPM levers aren't exactly matched. One might be lower than the other. Usually to get... Um, rid of the harmonic oscillation. You have to have the right prop lever a little bit lower. And what I mean by harmonic oscillation is that if you fly a twin engine long enough, you start to pick up on the subtle things. And one of the big things as an instructor is my pet peeve is that you hear that wow, 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 wow. You know, the, the engines are not synced and there's a bit of a, a humming noise that kind of goes wow, 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 back and forth. And as you get further away, they go wow, 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 wow. So you want to slow that down where it goes wow, wow, wow. You know, that if they're perfectly synced and the RPM of both engines, is exactly the same. That's what you should hear there. There should be no wow noise, basically. Uh, there's there's got to be a technical term for that. But um, yeah, so you set the the RPM. The the levers might be slightly off by about like half a centimeter to get that, that sweet spot on them. When it comes to manifold pressure, what you'll find is that in the circuit, once you've set it, it's pretty much good where it is. Uh, if you're going to be doing extended climb, like going out to the training area, the uh, because of the decrease in air pressure as you climb your manifold pressure will drop off as well. So what you'll find is a normal climb out to the practice area. If you're going up to 5,000 feet, you might have to increase the throttles as you go to keep it at um, 31.5. Like if you don't adjust it, you just set the throttles 
there'll be 31.5 right after takeoff but by the time you get to uh, 5,000 feet it'll probably probably be closer to about 26 or 27 inches it's, it's a considerable drop as you go and this is one of the things that i'll say is that if you end up flying this aircraft up to 25,000 feet which no one here is going to be doing that but if you did then this is why the throttles eventually will reach you know to the firewall but you can't do that on the ground because you will overboost the engine. Uh, and just by the by, when it comes to overboosting, there is an enunciator light that comes on. So if you go past 40, enunciator light should come on to indicate the overboost condition. I haven't seen it yet. And I've seen a couple of students that have gone past 40. So don't, don't think of 40 as a brick wall. You don't want to go past it because that would be bad. But uh, it's not the end of the world if you do. If, if, if you go past 40, you get a little yellow light on your enunciator panel tells you you've gone too far. And that's an indication that uh, when you overboost, the, the way the turbocharger works, is that you're using exhaust gases to run a compressor that's going to compress the air coming into the cylinders. And with compressed air, you can add more fuel, you get more bang and gives you more thrust. Now, if the engine's producing too much power, that uh, turbocharger RPM could be too high. And to protect that turbocharger from you know, spinning itself to death, basically, we have something that is called a waste gate that opens up and it allows some of that exhaust gas to bypass the turbocharger and just be uh, expelled overboard. So uh, when you see the overboost conditions telling you that wastegate has opened up and you're losing power from your turbocharger. So it's, it's, a, it's a sign that uh, the engine is protecting itself, but it means that you're losing that compressed air uh, as part of the turbocharger that's going into the cylinder. So it's a loss of, a loss of power. Uh, it's, it's just not good for the, air, uh, for the performance of the aircraft, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it's actually going to damage it. Uh, so just try to keep yourself between that 35 to 40. Now, when it comes to the, uh, the crosswind turn here, specific procedure that we have in Regina, and it really should be true for most, air, uh, most airports, is that you do not initiate this crosswind turn until you've reached the latter of either the end of the runway or 500 feet AGL. 500 feet AGL. And the reason for this is because, um, Obviously, you might, if you're taking off from the runway threshold, you might get up to 500 feet very quickly. And if you're only like halfway along the runway and you're dealing with like a really strong headwind day, you don't want to turn crosswind right here and then end up in like, an, or like a mid downwind because that's going to cut the, the time you have in that circuit short. Uh, it's going to give you less time to do all the things that you need to do. So flying upwind a little bit before you start that crosswind turn would be good for you. But this is a specific procedure that the Regina Airport Authority has uh, implemented for us at the Flying Club here. So no turns below before that point. If you're not at 500 feet, um, you know, keep climbing straight ahead until you, you hit that altitude. And uh, 500 feet AGL works out to be 2,400 feet ASL. Uh, here at the airport because our airport is 1900 feet above sea level so that's what i'm looking for i'm waiting until i see the end of the runway or 2400 feet on my altimeter then i'll start my crosswind turn another thing to mention with that crosswind turn and this is true whether you're flying a cessna 152 or a jet uh no more than 15 degree bank angle in the climbing turn this is to prevent uh, or reduce the likelihood of a stall on the uh, upwind uh, on the upward wing because when you're in a banked attitude you can stall the upward wing if you if you overbank. So 15 degree bank only in a climbing turn. If you are in a level or descending turn, then you are able to go right up to 30 degrees. That's not a problem. So we'll start our turn. And what you'll find is that if you're gonna be flying circuit altitude, and just as a nice review, circuit altitude here in Regina, where it is 2,900 feet ASL, a uh, thousand feet above ground, you'll probably reach circuit altitude by about an, like a mid downwind at the latest. Uh, it comes up pretty quick because your aircraft is gonna have fantastic performance. And this is, the, the big adjustment people will find coming from a single engine to a multi-engine is that the you'll hit your circuit altitude really quick. You've really got to uh, see that coming and anticipate it, or it might catch you. And there's a lot of people who they'll, they'll see 2,900 feet just as it passes below them, and they start doing that, that hard pushover to get back to your altitude, which I don't mind. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. I'd rather have you be aggressive with pitching the nose down to level off as opposed to blowing an altitude. That's more important. So if, you know, try to be smooth if you can. Try to see it coming, but... Uh, uh, yeah, just uh, be aware of how much quicker this aircraft is going to move. Now, when you do level off the aircraft, obviously 31.5 inches manifold pressure, 2450 RPM is going to be way too fast. That's a climb power. The plane, if you kept that power setting, the, the aircraft will accelerate very quickly into the yellow arc of the airspeed indicator, you know, well above 160, 170 knots or 160, 170 miles per hour. So the cruise power setting that you'll use when you are in, um, in the circuit is anywhere really from 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure and the RPM will be 2,400. Um, now the power setting that I say there, oh, I don't wanna do that. 
the power setting that I say here, 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure, that's a uh, ballpark, right? It's not, don't, uh, it's not enshrined in gold or anything like that. Uh, the, the real purpose for that is that this power setting should give you an airspeed of approximately 120 miles per hour. Oops. 120 miles per hour. That's, that's basically what we're shooting for. Because uh, 120 miles per hour is a very comfortable uh, airspeed in the circuit. It's, it's quick enough to allow you to maintain altitude effectively, but it's not so fast that you're going to have to worry about, oh my God, I need to slow down to extend my gear or my flaps. 120 is really nice because it's, it's already below the gear and flap speed. So that's nice to use. If you were going out um, to the practice area, then, oh yeah, you can definitely use a higher power setting than this. Like you could use anywhere we say in the twin from 25 up to 29 inches manifold pressure. Uh, but that would be like way too fast. That's that speed ranges of anywhere between 140 to 160 miles per hour. So that's, that's too much for this. Now in the, um, actually, what do I, maybe I can draw. Uh, yeah, I'll use this. Uh, I wish this was color coded. The zoom tools don't have uh, very nice uh, whiteboard tools. It's just basic black and white. But um, once you're leveled off, so you level off and rule of thumb for leveling off is that you take 10% of your vertical speed. So if I'm climbing at a thousand feet per minute, then around a hundred feet before that is when I want to initiate my level off. I'll set my power 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure, bring my RPM back a little bit more down to 2,400. Uh, that should set me up nicely. Now, once I'm leveled off, things are going to happen quickly. So the first thing I'll say is that in this area, oh, no, that's not what I want. Can I undo that? I want to draw this tool. Yeah, this works. Uh, in this part of the circuit, kind of in the late crosswind, early downwind, this is the point where you want to do something called your pre-landing check. Uh, and what a pre-landing check is kind of it's the same as it would be for a Cessna 172. You're just checking all the switches and all the, um, for lack of a better word, switches and uh, um, instruments to make sure that they are where they should be and get ready for the landing. Uh, a nice easy way to remember the pre-landing check is I just work left to right across the cockpit and then top to bottom, uh, kind of kind of a flow from one side to the other, making sure that everything's where it should be. So the things I'm going to check on the left side of the aircraft, I'm going to make sure that my basically checking spark, fuel, and air. That's the, the three big the, for the combustion of the aircraft. So on the left side, we have our electrical panel, and I'm going to check my magnetos, make sure that they are in the on position. You don't, don't ever turn those off. Uh, obviously in flight, but you're just confirming they're in the on position. Confirm my master is on, confirm my alternators are in the on position. In front of me, I have my instrument gauges for the temperatures and pressures, like my oil temperatures and oil pressures. I want to confirm those are in the green. I'm going to check my throttle quadrant, specifically making sure my mixture is in the full rich position. Just below the throttle quadrant, I have my alternate air, and I want to make sure that that is uh, in the uh, off position, because the alternate air should be off. And then in between the seats, there is the fuel select valves. I want to make sure that those are in the normal on position. So there's really only five or six things that I'm checking, but I want to make sure those are all where they should be before I come in for a landing. The most important one is probably the mixture, making sure the mixture is full rich. So um, doing our pre-landing check uh, in the late crosswind, early downwind. And then once that's done, um, as far as, and I should say, when it comes to the circuit shape, uh, I already said that in when you take position on the runway, your HSI should be showing you uh, your, your heading bug and your HSI needle pointing at the 12 o'clock position. So when obviously like when you're in the crosswind here, you can kind of use that HSI to be a, a rough approximation for if, I, if it's at 90 degrees to me, then I'm flying a crosswind. And then when I'm flying the downwind, it should be full opposite reversed. Um, don't forget, you do still have the GPS to look at. There is um, um, a data field there to tell you what, you what your path across the ground is. So I'll just, for our purpose of our example here, I'll just imagine that this is runway 13. And for runway 13, if you actually look at the aerodrome chart, the um, runway track on takeoff is 128 degrees, um, 128 degrees magnetic. So if I'm flying on the crosswind leg, then I believe that is 218 degrees magnetic. And then if I'm flying in the downwind, I should be at 308 degrees magnetic. So these are little things that you can use to um, you know, look at the, the GPS and see what your track is across the ground. If I was in a downwind and I'm flying a track of 300, then okay, I'll just correct a little bit to the right. And that's perfectly correcting me for the crosswinds, which is a nifty little trick. Now in the downwind, about mid downwind, uh, just as you're coming a beam the tower, this is the point where you want to uh, give tower a call. So say call tower. 
and let them know, oh, I'm in the right downwind runway one, three, four, either a touch and go or a stop and go. For the, uh, the first little bit, we'll just do stop and goes because it gives you time to reconfigure the aircraft, get yourself settled, and then do the takeoff. As we get more and more practice with this, we'll start doing touch and goes so that you're comfortable with that. And uh, when you call a tower, they're going to give you your sequence. They're going to tell you, oh, you're number one for uh, runway 13 or you're number two, whatever the case is. Uh, and if you can find whatever traffic you're following, that's good. Now, no matter what, if they say you're number one or number two, the next thing that I'm going to do immediately after that is I'm going to uh, lower the gear, lower landing gear. Um, I want to get that done right away, just so we don't forget about it, because that, it's an important thing and I want to make sure it gets done. Uh, if, you, if you're like number three for the uh, runway and there's a couple of aircraft that are stacked up on final, um, lowering the gear at this point, it's not... It doesn't need to be done that early. You could extend your downwind, and then when you're, you know, a little bit further out, then you can drop the gear. Uh, lowering the gear here does mean that you'll ha have extra drag, and the aircraft uh, might have. And that's the other thing to say is that when you drop the gear, that extra drag will cause the aircraft to slow down. So you might need to bump up the power a little bit. But I, I like doing it right after that call, so we don't forget, and the aircraft is good to go. It doesn't harm it. It just makes it a little bit uh, more draggy. Uh, once the uh, the gear is down, the next thing that you're going to want to do pretty much right away is your gumps check and let's talk about what a gumps check is so i'll do it over here uh gumps check is basically something you should do on any kind of retractable gear aircraft to make sure that it's all set up for landing and there will be a little bit of overlap between the gumps check and the pre-landing check but we'll go through that so g stands for uh gas which you would think of stand for gear but it actually stands for gas so we're making sure that the fuel select valve between the seats is in the on position the letter u is undercarriage. i can't remember if that's one word or two but I'll make it one. Oh, what the hell? We'll make it uh, two words. Carriage. No, it makes sense more as one word. So undercarriage. So, and this is nice because when I lower the landing gear, I start my gumps check. By the time that I've gotten to the letter U, that's when the gear is fully down and locked. So then I just confirm three green, one in the mirror. I look at my um, left engine nacelle. There's a little mirror on the nacelle, and I should see the nose gear extended reflected to me. So I'm going to confirm that the uh, the gear is down and locked, three green, one in the mirror. M stands for mixture. We already checked that as part of the pre-landing check, but we're extra paranoid. We're gonna check that again, mixture full reg. And then P stands for props. We make sure that our uh, propeller lever is in the max RPM. So mixture full reg, props to max, and you're pretty much ready to go. There is a, a last letter here for S. Um, we don't really have much for S. It's something you could say um, switches and seat belts if you really wanted to. Uh, Seatbelt should always be on anyway, so that's, I guess you're confirming something that's already been done, but we, we're doing the same thing with mixture, so why not? And switches, basically, you could say that's um, like your light switches, so like a landing light or something like that. This is something I would start considering doing if you're doing night circuits, so making sure, uh, oh yeah, I'll make sure my lights are on and you know whatever else needs to be done. We don't do circuits at night, like any of the time we're going flying in the multi um multi vfr training it'll be a daytime flight because we're going to be doing upper air work and stuff like that um in the ifr world we might end up doing some night flights depends on the conditions um and depends on the hours that your instructor is available if they're doing night stuff or not but uh it's just something to be aware of there's no big uh, i know guys get excited about doing night circuit or night flying in the ifr but it's no different than night flying in vfr so call tower mid downwind as soon as i'm done talking to them so i'd say Tower Papa Zulu Oscar, and that is our call sign, by the way. It's Golf Papa Zulu Oscar. That's probably Bears uh, putting up here. Uh, golf. Technically, it's Charlie Golf Papa Zulu Oscar. Uh, so that's our call sign. And um, so I say, Tower, this is uh, Papa Zulu Oscar in the right now and runway one three for a stop and go. I say, Papa Zulu Oscar, Regina Tower Raji, your number one for landing, or they might clear us for landing, whatever it happens to be. And I say, uh, Papa Zulu Oscar, Roger, number one. I go immediately. Speed check, confirm I'm below 140 miles per hour. Gear down, gums check, gas on the mains, undercarriage, three green, one in the mirror, mixture, full rich, props, max, switches and seat belts if I need to, that kind of thing. And now you're pretty much all ready to go for the landing. Because this is the big part of this um, flying the aircraft in the twin, because it moves so quickly, is time management, is making sure you get everything done in a timely fashion. This is why I recommend doing this pre-landing check, kind of even on the late crosswind. The earlier you do this stuff, the easier it's going to be for you. Because if you forget to do the pre-landing check until early downwind here, then that's going to delay everything coming down the line. And you'd be surprised that the difference between a late crosswind and early downwind is like 20 seconds. 
it comes fast. So you always got to think, what's the next thing I need to do? If you forget that pre-landing check deal here, that's going to delay your tower call. And then when the tower, tower call gets delayed, especially if the radios are busy, that's going to delay your gear down. That might delay your gums check. That's going to delay everything. So it really starts back here. If you can get this done quick, it's going to help you out. Now, if you are, like I said, number two or number three for landing, then you will extend downwind. So it gives you more time to get yourself settled. The thing to remember is if you're going to be extending downwind, then you can delay your descent from circuit altitude, right? Because if I get all the way out, like a, like a three or four miles away from the field, when I turn base, I don't need to start leaving. Like I don't need to start descending at that point because I'm so far away. I could probably stay at circuit altitude on the base leg until I get to final. Um, and then on final, the three mile finals, when normally when you would start that descent out of circuit altitude. But if you're number one, you start your turn, and I'll draw a line here. You start your turn when there is a 45 degree angle between yourself and uh, the runway. So it should be a 45 degrees uh, right there. So you're kind of looking over your shoulder. And uh, there are different landmarks that we can use. Like if you've been doing circuits at the Regina Flying Club and you're familiar with the area, the circuit shape and the circuit distances are all going to be exactly the same. The only difference is you're, you're in an aircraft that's moving faster. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Regina area, then you know we'll point out some landmarks for you. The most common, uh, commonly used runways in Regina are either runway 26 or runway 13, runway thir uh, 31 to a lesser extent, and then almost never runway 08. So if you're getting ready for a flight test, make sure you're most familiar with those runways for landmarks. Um, but yeah, you wait till the runway is 45 degree off your shoulder, and then you're going to initiate your turn from downwind to base. Now, what I'll say is uh, I'm actually going to delete some things here because I want to uh, free up some space. But the first thing you want to do when you uh, are ready to start this turn, and this is important, is I'm going to start by reducing the power first. So I would start by reducing my power to about 15 inches manifold pressure. Um, and a nice way to remember that we say in, in 150 or 172 normal RPM for a descent is about 1500 RPM. So this kind of you can kind of put that uh, false equivalency between the two of them. But uh, 15 inches manifold pressure is a ballpark starting value. It's not always going to be that, right? We said you know even in the cruise flight, 15 or sorry, 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure is roughly the power setting that will give you 120 miles per hour. We say in the descent. 15 inches manifold pressure is roughly the power setting that will help you descend, but some days you might need more, some days you might need less. So it's up to you to decide uh, what's appropriate. Uh, you're going to reduce the power first. You're then going to roll the aircraft. You're going to set yourself up to an angle of bank of 30 degrees immediately. And like I said, in a descending turn or in a level turn, you can go up to 30. And then you're going to go immediately to flaps 10. And the reason why I kind of put it in that order and I kind of create the urgency for that is because um, it works out well, I'll just say that, is that the aircraft is going to be moving so quickly on the base leg that if you don't get those flaps 10 right in that turn there, uh, the aircraft is going to be closing that distance really quickly. You'll end up swinging wide through the final approach path and it just becomes much harder. So power, bank, flaps right away. And that's, that's I do those three every time it works out really nice. Uh, not to say it has to be done like that, like you could do bang. And here's the thing, the reason why I say power first is because you wanna start slowing the plane down, you wanna start initiating that descent. 30 degrees because you wanna keep a nice sharp crisp turn for this base, uh, base leg. And then 10 degrees of fat to keep the aircraft slowing down. Uh, the one thing I'll say when it comes to the, the base leg here in terms of uh, uh, track, I think the track is uh, 128. My numbers might be, no, that looks good. One, two. No, it's not one, two, eight. Uh, that's on final. What is it? Uh, whatever the base leg is. Uh, zero, three, eight. That's what it was. Zero, three, eight. Um, that's the, the basically the, the track that you want to have across the ground on the base leg. So you look at your GPS and you kind of compare. Uh, now on the base leg itself, as far as an airspeed goes, because we said in the downwind, you want to be about 120 miles per hour. In the base leg, you want to be 110. 110 works out very nicely. Uh, it slows you down, but uh, you're still covering a good amount of distance. And the other thing that we're balancing out in the twin is that you don't want to be catching up to other aircraft in the circuit, but you don't want to be so close that aircraft behind you are catching up either. So it's a bit of a, a balancing act. And what you'll find too, is that if you're on a busy day where there's a lot of aircraft in the circuit, oftentimes they'll put the Cessna aircraft in a right-hand circuit and they'll put the twin by itself on a left-hand circuit. So that's how they keep us apart from each other. And then when we eventually converge ourselves on a final, 
uh, tower. We'll try to space this out so that it works out pretty nicely. But our base leg should be about 120 miles per hour. Now, when I'm ready to go from base to final, and you always want to start by leading that turn a little bit. You don't want to wait until you're right on the final approach course, obviously, because then you'll blow wide and swing too far. But on the uh, when I'm ready to make that turn, I hope I'm not going to run out of space here. But uh, this is going to be the same thing. Angle of bank is going to be, oops, angle of bank will be 30 degrees. And um, then I'm going to go right to flap, flaps 25, which is the, uh, the second flap setting. Can I make that bigger? Select. I'm trying to make good use of the space that I have here. Anyways, something like that. So that's, that's the, uh, I should put it right there. Flaps 25, 30 degree bank angle, turn yourself on final. The uh, airspeed that you want to have on a long final is going to be 105 miles per hour. And this is a very important airspeed because sometimes on final, you don't need to go more than uh, uh, 20 degrees, tw sorry, 25 degrees of flaps. Uh, the only time that you should go more than 25 degree flap is if it's a, a wind calm day, you've got two engines operating and um, you're not suspecting any icing on the wing. So you just go straight to flaps 40, which is going to be the final flap setting. However, if you do have any of those situations where you're coming in, you've either had an engine failure or a really strong crosswind, or you suspect there's icing on the wings, then you're not gonna go beyond this point. You're not gonna go beyond flaps 25. You're not gonna go any slower than, than 105. So this will be the final configuration of your aircraft. The consequence of this having a higher airspeed and a lower flap setting than your normal final approach speed is that the aircraft will float and flare a little bit longer. So something to be uh, keeping in mind when you're, if you're trying to hit a touchdown point with th this kind of configuration. Now, as you're getting close to about a one mile final, this is when you want to get the aircraft fully configured. At this point, you're going to use flap 40 and slow the aircraft down to its final approach speed, which is going to be 95 miles per hour. This would be, like I said, about one mile final um, once you're clear to land and then bring yourself in for that landing. So, this is, you know, there's a lot of things in this circuit here. You can see there's a lot of things that are, are to do, and uh, it comes at you quick. The more you do this, uh, the easier it gets. And um, this is why during the first lesson, we'll just do like a normal flight. We'll go out to the practice area, we'll do our lesson. And even on the first lesson coming back, if you haven't observed uh, a landing in the twin yet, I'll demonstrate, or whoever your instructor is, will demonstrate the landing to you. If uh, you've done uh, as a passenger and you've seen it at some point, then you'll be able to do the landing. This is why it's nice sometimes in your training if, uh, if you haven't started your multi-training yet, but um, you just go up to your instructor that has, happens to be teaching, say, hey, listen, can I ride in the back and kind of see how it's done? And that's a nice way to at least, at least you can say you've seen it and then you can try the landing on the first time that you go flying. Uh, but once that first lesson is done, then it's a good opportunity to, uh, to get, and we'll do some circuits on a regular basis. Like we'll do one lesson fully dedicated circuits. It's, uh, it's up to your instructor to decide when to do that circuits lesson. Sometimes uh, it's good to make hay while the sun shines. And if the, the weather's nice, the winds are calm, the ceiling's high, it, I'd rather go out to the practice area and do the upper air work maneuvers uh, than work on circuits. circuits. The circuit lesson is useful for days when maybe the ceiling is low, but not you know, below our circuit altitude limits and the winds are reasonable. And then you can, okay, we can still at least do some kind of exercise to keep ourselves busy and to kind of progress the training. But this is the, uh, the introduction to the circuit procedures. Um, now, when it comes to landing itself, this is probably the most important thing, I don't wanna leave this out, is that when it comes to flaring the aircraft, uh, first of all, you'll flare the aircraft at about a one wingspan height. So roughly about 30 feet above the ground, or we say generally when, the, uh, when you feel the earth rushing up at you, when you see the edges of the uh, runway in your peripheral vision, that's when you're ready to do the flare. Make sure you bring both throttles all the way to idle and you know, make sure that they're all the way down. If you don't want to be flaring with power in this aircraft, it doesn't end well. So make sure the throttles are all the way to idle. Uh, if you bring your throttles to idle and you hear that, you know, a, a, a loud horn, that tells you you've forgotten something. That's the landing gear. Uh, the other thing is if you go uh, beyond flaps 25 without the gear down, you'll get a, a horn as well. So if you hear those noises, get the hell out of there, uh, max power and, and begin your climb um, and do an overshoot. And the overshoot procedure is power, flaps up, gear up. Uh, that's the way we do that in this aircraft. Uh, and power again would be 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure. Normally when we are increasing the power, we would confirm that the props are forward and then we go throttle. But uh, we already did confirm the props are forward because uh, we did that in the comps check. So that's nice. So we go props, or sorry, throttles to full, flaps up and then gear up. And normally in the airlines, in most places we say gear up when they got two positive rates of climb. So the altimeter is showing a climb and the vertical speed is showing a climb. Um, 
So that would be the go around procedure. But in the flare, so providing you don't get that gear warning horn going off, you bring both throttles to idle. And by the way, that gear warning horn goes off. It's supposed to go off at any power setting less than 14 inches manifold pressure if the gear is still selected up or at any flap setting beyond flaps 25 if the gear is still selected up. Uh, in practice, when that horn goes off, it's closer to 11 or 12 inches manifold pressure. So just, it's an old plane. Yeah, we got to be careful with it. But I bring the throttles to idle. And then I'm actually, this is one of the few aircraft I would say, take your hand off the throttle quadrant and put both hands on the yoke and use both hands to flare this aircraft. The reason for that is this aircraft is very nose heavy. Um, and unless you've been working out at the gym, you got really strong biceps. I'm sad to say I, I do not. Uh, it's very heavy to flare this aircraft. So having two hands there is, uh, is handy. The aircraft will flare a little bit more flat than uh, you may be accustomed to in Cessna 172, but the, um, you'll still be bringing the dash close to the horizon. You still want to touch down on the main landing gear first, but uh, it, uh, it's not going to be, you're not going to raise the nose too high because you may inadvertently risk uh, striking the tail. We want to avoid that as well. Um, if you do find yourself in a situation where you kind of put the nose in a little bit hard, it starts to bounce a little bit, keep that back pressure in there. Try to keep it the nose up to prevent having a, uh, either a slamming hard on the nose wheel or risk a, a prop strike. If it gets really nasty, then get yourself out of there. Don't, don't try to save a bad landing if it's not going to work out. Uh, eventually, the aircraft, once you get it planted on the runway, uh, it will settle to a stop. And one thing about the aircraft is that the, the main landing gear... Um, uh, oleos, the shock, shock absorbers, basically, what you'll find is that when the aircraft comes to a stop, it sinks down on them. And then you know that you're ready for the, uh, uh, to continue on the exercise. Sometimes you have to wait for them to kind of compress and then you're, you're prepared for the next takeoff. If you're doing a touch and go, you don't have to wait for that. Once, once the gear, um, I should say, once the wheels are all on the ground, you're pretty much ready to go again. The airspeed's starting to slow down. Just reconfigure the aircraft, take the, uh, the flaps, push the button on top, lower it to the floor, and then set thrust and you're good for takeoff again. Um, obviously wait for the aircraft, probably a slow below 60 miles per hour before you start doing that kind of stuff, but you don't have to wait to come to a total stop. So that is the, uh, the circuit procedures for this aircraft. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that might be useful, um, in a Regina specifically or on this airplane. Um, we will at some point do single engine approach and landing and, um, actually I'll talk about that at the end of this briefing, cause well, it kind of folds nicely into that. So I'm now gonna clear this, clear all my drawings. And now we're gonna talk about one of the major exercises in the um, multi-training is going to be the engine failure. So one of the, it's usually by about less than three or four, we head out to the practice area and we start to do uh, simulated engine failures in flight. Now we'll start off by doing this obviously at a high altitude. We never do any kind of an engine failure scenario, anything lower than 4,000 feet. This is for our mutual safety in case things really go bad on us. So we'll actually usually normally start this at 5,000 feet ASL, which is about 3,000 feet AGL. And uh, the first time we do this, the instructor will demonstrate it to you. And the way that we simulate an engine failure in uh, the twin is just like you do in a, in a single engine. You just bring the throttle to idle. So we're going to start by bringing a throttle to idle and showing you how the aircraft is going to perform. And the first thing I'll say about... Um, Actually, I'll just make this full screen. Let's stop sharing. Uh, the first thing I'll say about uh, the engine failures in cruise, uh, so you're fly simulating that you're on a cross country, you're in cruise flight, is that when an engine failure happens, you're obviously going to start slowing. The aircraft will naturally start slowing down. Uh, but there's no need to panic right away because you might be cruising along at 140, 150 miles per hour, but the, uh, the aircraft still has plenty of speed. It's not until I get close to maybe 110, 120, I start to get really concerned. So engine failure happens. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to control the aircraft. I'm going to start by applying rudder to cause the aircraft to keep going straight and maybe a little bit of bank in the direction of the good engine. And actually, I'm going to go back to my share because I realized there's something I want to talk about with the uh, uh, when to apply rudder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture. Oops, put that up here, draw. Yeah, that sort of works. Uh, what else can I draw? I'm gonna draw this. So we're saying this is basically your turn coordinator. There's my little aircraft. I got the two tick marks for a uh, uh, level or rate one turn. And then down on the bottom, I've got this little guy, which is called the uh, inclinometer. Uh, let's use this line here. And it's got the two little tick marks right here. Uh, and I'm no artist, I need to draw a ball. So then your ball should normally be right in the middle, right? If you're in cruise flight, this is what it's going to look like. However, if an engine failure happens, 
I'll undo that. Your ball is going to shoot off to one side in particular. Uh, can I do that here? Yes, yeah, so your ball is going to come. Do that. Yeah, there we go. Your ball is going to come off to the side like this. Now, obviously, that's an indication of um, um, a right engine failure. So the way that this we look at this is that if the ball comes off to the side, that's the side where the good engine is. So what's going to happen is that the aircraft will try to yaw aggressively in the direction of the failed engine, and um, the ball is going to shoot off to the one side. So this is, a, this is a right engine failure in the situation. Now, when that when this initial failure happens, the, the most important thing that you need to do in an engine failure is control the aircraft. We say control power drag. And I'm going to start off controlling the aircraft by stepping on the ball, but I'm not actually going to bring this ball to the middle. Uh, because what's happening when you have an engine failure, you're only getting thrust from that one engine, but that thrust is not at the center line of the aircraft. That's an, that thrust is offset. So because of that, um, a coordinated uh, flight for an aircraft flying single engine when the engine is only producing thrust on the one side is actually like this. So for you to fly coordinated in a multi-engine aircraft with one engine failed, you actually have to bisect the ball. You put the ball about halfway out. And now this is a perfectly coordinated flight with single engine. Uh, we call this a zero side slip condition. So this is what we're shooting for. When that initial failure happens, you step on the ball. The ball is going to be out here. And I always say we step on the ball. So if the ball is to the left, I put left rudder in. And I have to move the ball right as far as here. If I push the ball too far, if I, so if I push the rudder too much and it moves to the center, uh, that's too much rudder. So I want to have it right, right about here. And again, about three to five degree bank angle in the direction of the good engine. With this engine failure as well, the aircraft is going to lose a little bit of lift. So you'll actually have to have a little bit of back pressure. So three things are going to happen when that initial failure happens. First, step on the ball. That's number one most important thing. And aileron in direction of the good engine. If you forget which way it is, just aileron in direction that your rudder is being pushed. So if I'm pushing left rudder, my left foot is pushing the pressure, I automatically should bank in that direction uh, just a little bit. And then a little bit of back pressure as well. Uh, so that's the control part of this. The zero side slip, have the ball half out. Uh, the next thing that you're going to do, and I might as well write this in here. So it's control power drag. So control, I said, step on the ball, roll a little bit in the good engine, a little bit of back pressure. And then power, basically, for me, poor power, power uh, is mixture, full rich, rich, props, Max RPM and then throttle to full. So a nice way to think about um, when I'm increasing power in this aircraft, I work right to left, mixture, pitch, power. Keep in mind that thro full throttle in this aircraft is not above 40 inches. So it's about halfway up the throttle lever, um, the throttle angle there. So once I'm producing full power, then I wanna worry about cleaning up the drag of the aircraft and the, the way that we clean up the drag is the same way we do the missed approach. Uh, we always start by retracting the, um, uh, the flaps first, flaps up, and then gear up. And the reason for that is that flaps produce a lot, produce a lot of drag, um, but also I'm going to hit my flap speed limit before I hit my gear speed limit. So flaps up, gear up. And then at that point, what I want to do, and here's the thing, if you're in cruise flight, your flaps and gear should already be in the up position. So you're still, you're just confirming, but just give them a love tap, make sure they're in the right position. It's a good habit to get into because when we start talking about doing engine failures in the overshoot, where you're doing an engine failure scenario with the gear and flaps down, then you absolutely will have to retract those things. Uh, but we'll confirm the flaps up and gear up. And then we're going to do something called identify and verify because we want to know First of all, which engine is causing me the trouble? And then I want to confirm it uh, because there have been incidents in the past. There was a Boeing 737 in England. They had an engine failure and they accidentally shut down the wrong engine. And then more recently in Indonesia, I think it was Air Asia, um, a flight in, in Indonesia, they accidentally shut down the wrong engine and killed like 40 or 50 people. It was pretty bad. That was the one where the aircraft crashed onto a bridge and then into a ravine. Uh, it was caught on some dash cams. It was pretty nasty. Now, when it comes to the identify part, of this uh, procedure. Identify, we say dead foot, dead engine. Um, because like I said, in a situation where I'm putting nothing but, uh, oh, select, uh, I'm putting a ton of left rudder in so just to keep the aircraft in a zero side slip coordinated state. My right foot in this situation is doing nothing. And so it's my dead foot. And that's an indication, dead foot, dead engine. So that's my, my right engine is dead. Oh, I can't go. I, 
I don't think I can uh, readjust the text after I leave it. That's a pain. Um, I'll have to move this around a little bit. But anyway, so that's identify. Then when it comes to verify, uh, I'm going to verify by uh, reducing the throttle on that engine to idle. And uh, as long as I, and first, I'll say, uh, first of all, I'll say that when you bring your throttle to idle, do it slowly because you don't, potentially, if there's power coming from that engine, you suddenly chop it, then the plane's going to swing from side to side wildly. Um, so do it slowly. But assuming you've, you've selected the correct engine, you confirm that throttle to idle, you should see no adverse performance. There should be no yaw effect because all you're doing is throttling down the engine that's dead anyway, so there shouldn't be anything going on. Um, now, later on, when we start talking about uh, engine failures that you give to yourself, like if you're in cruise flight and you recognize that um, your oil pressure has dropped off, your temperature's through the roof, and you're planning to do an intentional in-flight engine shutdown, um, bringing your throttles idle is a very nice thing to do to yourself because it makes it easier to control. But so we identify dead foot, dead engine, verify, reduce the throttle to idle, and then we're going to do a cause check and restart. Um, so now that you've, you know which engines failed, and I should back up by saying when it comes to verifying the throttle in flight in practice, that throttle is already going to be at idle anyways, because that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you the engine failure and you're just going to confirm, yeah, it's the right one or yeah, it's the left one. I can already see it's at idle, but at least put your hand on it, make sure it's at idle. And then when it comes to, if we're simulating that we're in a cross country, then you're at a safe altitude. So you should have time to do a cost check restart. So it's just like the pre-landing check that we talked about before. You work left to right across the cockpit, top to bottom. You're just checking all the switches are where they should be. So again, magnetos in the on position. I make sure I didn't accidentally hit them with my elbow. Confirm the master's on, confirm the alternator's on. Check my temperatures and pressures, make sure they're all in the green. Confirm my mixture's full rich. Confirm my alternate air is, uh, I can actually put my alternate air on and off because maybe my air intake is blocked and that's the reason why the engine failure took place. And then confirm the fuel select valves are in the on position. So I check all those things, make sure they're where they should be. If they are, and if I think that a, a restart is reasonable, then okay, I would say attempted restart. Now we're not actually going to do this in flight because uh, the engine's just windmilling, so it's not actually shut down. But what you could do is you could either turn to your instructor or examiner and say, I tried the restart, Did it was it successful? And they'll say 100% of the time, no, unless they're trying to, you know, they say, they might say yes the one time if you've been forgetting to check, but um, they'll say, no, the engine restart was unsuccessful. So then you're going to complete the rest of your shutdown. And when it comes to shutdown, or I should say more specifically, shutdown and feather that engine, uh, you're going to do that by um, bringing the throttle to idle, prop lever, lever uh, to feather, sometimes spelled just FX, and then uh, mixture will be idle cutoff. So that's how you do the shutdown. And that's very different from how, and if you recall, when I'm increasing power, I go mixture pitch power. When I'm shutting down the engine, I go power throttle mixture. So this kind of works in reverse. Um, but that is the full, uh, move this around a little bit. Yeah, it looks good. That is the, uh, the engine out drill. And this needs to be automatic. It needs to be the point where you've practiced, practiced this enough times that it can be fully automatic and you shouldn't need to think about it. Uh, now, most times people have difficulty with balancing control of the aircraft while they are doing this drill. I would say if you had to pick one, control the aircraft first, because that's what the examiner is marking on, right? He's in the um, multi VFR training, holding plus or minus 100 feet and plus or minus 20 degrees of heading is going to be the flight test standard. When you get to the IFR training, you're still gonna be doing this in IFR, but now you'll be under the hood, you'll be on, under instruments. You're still gonna be plus or minus 100 feet, but then in instrument flying, you'll be plus or minus 10 degrees of heading. So the tolerances get a little bit tighter and a little bit harder as you continue on. So to review, when I have an engine failure, don't panic, take a moment, step on the rudder right away, get that ball halfway out, a little bit of aileron, the direction of the rudder that I'm applying, a little bit of back pressure, that's control, power, mixture, pitch, Power to full, 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure. Confirm flaps up, confirm gear up. Identify, dead foot, dead engine. In this situation, right engine. Verify, confirm right throttle lever to idle. Bring it back slowly. It should already be at idle because that's what your instructor did to you. Uh, cause check restart. I work left to right across the cockpit. Make sure my mags are on both. Master on, alternators on. Temperatures and pressures in the green. Mixture full rich. Alternate air, I can check on and off. And fuel select valve in the on position. Uh, Mr. Instructor, is my, uh, I try to restart. Did it work? I'll say no. Okay, then I'll do my shutdown procedure, which is 
throttle to idle, propeller to feather, mixture idle cutoff. So that's the full drill. There's a lot of steps on that, but it needs to be rehearsed and completely practiced. We'll get into the engine failure. We basically introduce the engine failures by the second or third lesson. And by the time you get to about the fifth lesson, you should be quite proficient at, it, at this. So it comes quick. So make sure you practice with it. Now, once the aircraft is under control, then you kind of got to do your cleanup duties. And the way I think about um, uh, doing the cleanup, so the first of all, I say aviate, navigate, communicate. So aviate, fly the plane, you know, keep it level, keep it on heading. Uh, I want to make sure that my emergency procedure checklist is, is checked, make sure I've got everything done. So there is an emergency procedure checklist in the side pocket on the right seat where the instructor or the examiner will sit. So you just tell them that you would pull the checklist. They, if they want, they could get you to open up and find the, the specific steps in the checklist that you would need to look at. The only things that you'd really want to check in the emergency procedure checklist is steps that you might have missed that aren't covered by the drill. One of those might be the, uh, the fuel select valves, because if you've shut down the right engine and the left engine is still producing power, well, the left engine is drawing fuel only from the left tank, which means the fuel that's in the right tank isn't going anywhere. And if you stay in that state for a long enough time, you might have a fuel imbalance where the fuel on the left side is low and the fuel on the right side is high. Now, there is no fuel um, imbalance limitation on this aircraft but you might find with a lot of fuel in one wing tank, the plane wants to list in that direction. So what you can do if you follow the emergency procedure checklist, it would tell you to transfer the fuel. And the way that you transfer fuel in this aircraft particularly is that you would move the left-hand fuel select valve to the transfer position. The transfer position of the fuel select valve indicates the side that you're uh, transferring fuel to. Some aircraft have it the opposite way, but in this aircraft, moving the fuel select valve to the transfer position, or I should say the the cross feed position means that you're taking fuel into that engine from the opposite tank. So in a situation I have a left engine operating, right engine failure, I put the left fuel select valve to the cross feed position and that draws fuel from the right wing to keep the fuel balanced. Once I've got the emergency procedure checklist done, I make sure that's all done. I say aviate, navigate, communicate. I'm still flying the, the aircraft, navigate, decide where do I want to go? Well, if I'm in the practice area, uh, probably want to come back to Regina. If uh, I was doing a simulated cross country from Regina to Yorkton, well, how far, how far along this cross country am I? Maybe it would be beneficial for me to turn around and go back to Regina because they have better services there. If I land in Yorkton, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think they have uh, um, firefighting and uh, you know, medical services available there. They might have people on call out like the, the voluntary fire department or something like that, but I might be better off coming back to uh, Regina. Now, um, so make a plan of action, aviate, navigate, decide where you want to go, and then see, communicate, uh, advise ATC what you're doing. So I would, uh, depending on the situation, I, this is an engine failure situation is not critical life or death. You still got one engine operating. So there are different lines of thought on this. Personally, I'm of the mindset that this is a pan pan situation, advise ATC of an abnormal status and request assistance. However, uh, our examiner here in Regina specifically likes to hear a mayday call. So what I would do is I would say, Squawk 7700, and then I'd turn the frequency probably to whatever, if, if I was with Winnipeg Center on the en route, I would tune their frequency. Or if I'm just in the Regina practice area, I'd just tune up Regina Tower and I'd say, Mayday, 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 this is Piper Seneca, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar. I've had an engine failure in the practice area. I'm 15 miles south at 5,000 feet, uh, inbound for a landing. We've got two souls on board. And um, we're in a white plane with blue trim. This is Piper Seneca, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Uh, and then obviously I'd speak to ATC and we'd, we'd come up with a plan of action. But that's the, uh, the procedure for an engine failure in cruise. Now this procedure is the first one that we're going to practice. But as we progress through your training, we're start, gonna to start to do something called an engine failure in the overshoot. And it's gonna be pretty much the same drill but we're gonna set the aircraft up a little bit differently. So we're not actually going to do our overshoot exercise from close to the ground. Normally you could do approach and you could get down as low in the IFR world down to 200 feet and then you could be expected to do a, an overshoot procedure. For us, we're gonna simulate that we're doing our overshoot um, at altitude. So we'll start off probably around 5,000 feet or so. The examiner or your instructor will tell you that, okay, we're at 5,000 feet. I want you to set the aircraft up in the landing configuration with the gear down flaps 40. And we're going to initiate a normal descent at 110 miles per hour. And then that will tell you what your expected minima or simulated minima is. So they might say, oh, our simulated terrain today is at 4,400 feet. Our simulated minimums are going to be at 4,600 feet. And because we go props max at 100 feet above minima, 
in the IFR world, we'll say that will go props max at 4,700 feet. So then what you do is if starting at 5,000 feet, you reduce your power to around 14 or 15 inches manifold pressure, roughly. If you go lower than that, the plane will slow down easily. It's just, it slows down really quick and things start to happen in a hurry. So you don't need to bring it back too far. Just reduce the power a little bit to at least get the plane starting to slow down. 14, 15 inches manifold pressure seems to work out really nice. Below 140, speed checks, you're down. As soon as that gear goes down, I immediately go into my gumps check. Gas, confirm fuel select valves are in the on position. Undercarriage, three green, one the mirror, mixture full rich, and leaving the props until I'm 100 feet above minimum. Uh, when I get below 125, I'm going to go flaps to 40, and then I'm going to initiate my descent at 110 miles per hour. And the descent that you're trying to establish yourself at is around five to 600 feet per minute descent. If you're going down a lot faster than that, like 800, 900, 1,000 feet per minute descent, it's just going to be harder on you. It's just going to hit that minimums a lot quicker. And then coming out of it for the go around is just going to be more challenging. So pick a power setting that allows your rate of descent to be, to be moderate. Uh, I think it's just all about power selection. If I have a, a low power setting, that plane's going to be shooting down like a rocket. If I have a higher power setting, then it's going to be settling down quite a bit slower. So at 4,700 feet, I'll go props to max. At 4,600 feet, I'll hit my minimums. I'll do my go around. The thing to remember is that when it gets to uh, a common mistake that people make, and I see this all the time, is that when it comes to the uh, overshoot, people are so focused on getting their power up, they forget to pitch the nose up. So it should be a push and a pull at the same time. So throttles up and pitching the aircraft up at the same time. Uh, don't forget to do uh, both of those and or, or don't forget to do either one of those. Uh, so pitch the aircraft up normally around eight degrees nose up uh, or dash to the horizon uh, is, is a good pitch attitude for this aircraft. Get the aircraft going and don't be so paranoid because that we are going to give you an engine failure. The whole purpose of this exercise is at some point in your overshoot, an engine failure is going to take place. So, um, you know, don't be so paranoid that the moment you hit minimums, the engine failure is going to happen because it won't. Uh, the way that we do it here at the Regina Flying Club, we give you the engine failure once the thrust is set. So if you're taking time getting that thrust up, you know, take as long as you need to get the power set and get the aircraft climbing. But the moment you take your hand off there to start doing things like flaps and gear, that's when the instructor or the examiner is going to reach up and fail that engine on you. So just know that that's when it's going to take place. So you set your thrust, your hand comes off your... And because it's a normal go around, you're still going to go start reaching for the flaps first and then go for the gear. But that's when the failure is going to happen. So when the failure takes place, immediately the first thing I'm looking at is that ball. Which engine gave way? And then I'm going to step on the ball and put it to that half displaced position. Now, as soon as the, the engine failure happens, you kind of got to stop your missed approach. You might have been halfway going through flaps up and gear up. But whatever you do, you have to stop immediately and go into your engine failure drill control power drag. And what you'll notice is that in this situation, because you have a very high power setting on the remaining good engine, you're going to have a very large thrust vector that's causing you to yaw. So you're going to need a lot more rudder to keep this aircraft going straight. So that's a first big difference between these two exercises. In cruise flight, you'll need a moderate amount of rudder to keep the plane going straight. In an overshoot exercise, you'll need a lot of rudder to do this. So heads up on that. So you put that rudder almost to the floor. I mean, you, you'll still have room, but you're going to be pushing it a lot and your leg will get tired after a while. It's, so you can skip leg day at the gym after this, but uh, you'll push the rudder in a little bit of bank in the direction of the aircraft. And if, when it comes to the pitch of the aircraft, you're not trying to maintain level anymore. You are actually actively trying to climb this aircraft back to your starting altitude. So you might've had that go around at 46, 4,600 feet, but now you're trying to climb back up to 5,000. And the airspeed that we're going to be shooting for in that climb is 105 miles per hour. And I'll tell you right now that if you aren't exactly bang on with that airspeed, uh, the aircraft just isn't going to climb single engine, especially if it's a hot day out there. You'd be lucky some days to get 100 or 200 foot per minute descent single engine in this aircraft. It's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, the one thing I will caution you against is that it's always safer to be on the faster side of things as opposed to being the slower side of things. And in practice, if you actually pitch the nose up too much in that overshoot and your airspeed gets below 105 miles per hour, what you'll find is that the, um, um, you'll, you'll lose rudder effectiveness and it, you, the aircraft will yaw. So a common thing that will happen for people when they practice the engine failure in the overshoot is the air, if they find that the heading is really hard to maintain, usually the first thing I look at is what was your airspeed, what was your pitch? If you pitched up too much, that rudder effectiveness was diminished and the aircraft just starts to list off to one side or the other. So that's a, so keeping your speed high or at least 105 miles per hour or slightly higher than that is uh, going to be important. Now, obviously you don't want it too high because if your airspeed's too high, then you're probably descending. Um, so you can actually, you need to pitch that nose up. So control the aircraft, um, rudder, bank, and back pressure to 105 miles per hour. 
Uh, and then you go to your, your engine out drill, which is the same as we always do. Mixture full rich, props to max, and then throttles to full. Now you'll notice that those should already be done in the overshoot, right? You did the mixture full rich as part of the gums check. You did the props max 100 above your minimums, part of the gums check. And the throttle of the remaining good engine is already set to full because you set that as part of your go around. Obviously don't bring both throttles to full, right? We got to keep one down for the purpose of the exercise. So don't, don't rush to push both up, but keep the remaining one there. So you're just confirming everything is where it should be. And then you want to confirm, okay, flaps up, gear up, identify, Dead foot, dead engine, whatever it happens to be, that's my failed engine. Verify, confirm the throttle of that engine is to idle. And then you're just basically going to, uh, and I should say, when it comes to the um, overshoot, we don't have time to do a cost check restart. Uh, you're in a critical phase of flight. You don't have time to diagnose or troubleshoot. You need to immediately just go right to the shutdown feather. And the way that we do the, uh, the feathering procedure in this aircraft, well, in real life, it would be throttle idle, prop feather, and then mixed rattle cutoff. In practice, because we're not actually going to shut down an engine, you just turn to your instructor or your examiner and you say simulated left engine feather or simulated right engine feather, and then they put the aircraft into a zero thrust condition. For the instructors of you that might be watching this later, the zero thrust condition is between 11 and 12 inches manifold pressure and the prop lever to the aft detent. Uh, that's, that's a nice power setting. Um, and then you'll, what you'll do is you'll focus now, now that the drill is done, focus on flying that aircraft up to your starting altitude, which is 5,000 feet. There are, that takes time because we said it, you're climbing around 100 to 200 feet per minute. So it could take you two or three minutes to get yourself up to uh, your starting altitude again. And in that time, just focus on flying the plane. There's other things you could do. We could say that once you level off, yeah, you can do your emergency procedure checklist. Yeah, you can squawk 7700 and then you can make your mayday call. But just focus on flying the plane first. Don't worry about any of that stuff. It's secondary. Get yourself up safely to your circuit altitude. Keep yourself on heading, on airspeed. Those are the most important things at that phase of play. But yeah, once you level off, emergency procedure checklist, 7700, mayday call. So those are the, the two exercises, engine failure in cruise, engine failure in the overshoot. Um, if you suspected an engine, I was going to, I don't want to talk about engine fires just yet. There is a procedure here for engine fires where there's an extra step. I'll just kind of briefly introduce it. But if you have a fire, uh, you would do the, the check after the verify. Uh, your instructor will go into that more details here. We don't practice engine fire drills for whatever reason here in Regina. Uh, we can talk about it, but uh, it's not often used, so we're not going to dwell on it. Uh, but once you practice the engine failure in cruise, once you've got comfortable with the engine failure and the overshoot, the last remaining engine failure scenario that we're going to discuss is going to be one that you give yourself. And what I mean by that is that you're flying along, you're coming in for an approach, for example, and this is what will happen in your flight test, by the way, is that you'll, you'll do uh, your flight test. And at the end of either your multi-flight test or your IFR flight test, um, you're going to have to do a single engine approach and landing. Um, and the excess and the drill is pretty much the same as we just discussed. The only difference is the examiner might give you a scenario based engine failure. So, uh, let me discuss what that could be. So he could just turn to you and say, Oh, let's imagine that we're flying along and, uh, you look at your oil pressure gauge and it's, uh, you know, it's at the bottom of the green arc and the oil temperature is now getting to the top of the green arc. You go, what do you do? And the correct answer is, well, as long as it's still in the green, it's okay. If it starts to get out of the green, that's when I get concerned. That's why he's kind of checking and saying, okay, if it's in the green, it's fine. Don't panic just yet. Then he's going to say, oh, okay, now what happens if it goes out of the green? You go, okay, well, if my pressure is out of the green, it's getting into the yellow and the red, and my temperature is now going on the high side in the yellow or red, then that's probably an indication that you've had an oil pressure leak. So then I want to shut down that engine. So in our, for this example, we'll say that's the left engine that's giving us troubles. So if I'm going to be shutting down the engine, it's going to be the same thing, control power drag. So control, well, that's easy because... Even though the engine is losing oil and having that oil pressure, the temperature go up, it's still producing thrust. So the aircraft is producing an equal amount of thrust. I'm not worried about yaw. So control is easy. Just keep flying straight and level. Power. Okay, well, I'm still going to do mixture full rich, props to max, and throttles. I'm not going to bring them all the way to full. Now, the reason for this is that I know I'm going to be shutting down my left engine eventually. But if I bring my throttles, both throttles to full, um, while I'm in cruise flight, the aircraft's going to shoot away from me. It's going to go really fast and it's going to be really hard to control. The aircraft is going to want to climb. And for an exercise where the examiner is trying to verify your altitude control plus or minus 100 feet, going full power is just way, way too much. So what we'll probably end up using is about 30 inches manifold pressure. You don't need full, just about 30 inches or so. And then you're going to say drag. Okay, confirm flaps up gear up, which if you're in cruise flight, they should already be. 
Now identify, verify. Well, this is easy. Identify. Well, I just look at my my engine gauges. Says, well, it's the left engine is giving me trouble, so that's the identify. Verify. Well, I'm still going to start by reducing the throttle to idle. And again, this is why I say do it slowly because you're now giving yourself the engine failure. If I slam that throttle to idle, the aircraft's going to suddenly yaw from side to side, and that's going to make it hard for me to hold the heading. If, however, I bring it back slowly, this gives me the opportunity to put a little bit of right rudder in and keep the aircraft flying nice and straight. And it makes just a, a smoother exercise overall. Thing to remember though, is that as I bring that throttle down, the aircraft will want to slow down and lose altitude. So you might need to leave, have a little bit of back pressure. Um, so bring my throttle to idle. Cause check, restart. Well, of course not, right? I'm, I'm shutting down the engine in, intentionally. I know what the cause is. The cause is I've had an oil pressure leak or, or oil leak, and I'm not gonna restart because that could cause a seizure of the engine. Now, when it comes to the actual shutdown feather, well, again, I just turned, I, I've already brought the throttle to idle. I just turned to my instructor exam and say simulated right engine feather, and they do their magic, and now I'm in a zero thrust condition. So that's pretty much the exercise. I then say, I pulled the emergency procedure checklist, I'd squawk 7700, and I make a pin or a mayday call in this situation. And then you come in for your single engine approach and landing. Now, if you recall from the last lesson, we said that uh, if you're coming in single engine approach, you don't use full flaps, right? You use only flaps 25 and your final approach speed is going to be 105 miles per hour. Uh, the good thing is about uh, a single engine approach at the end of the flight, we're not measuring the accuracy of your touchdown point. Um, as long as you land within the first third of the runway, that is acceptable. However, if you're coming in two engine, we will be evaluating the, uh, the accuracy. So this is the last thing we'll talk about here and then we'll call it a night. So uh, let's draw a picture of the, the old runway. Maybe I can draw a bigger one. Yeah, yeah, great. Actually, that works out well. Uh, now let's. Oh, I don't know if I can. Actually, I'll have to undo that. So I'll delete that. I'll make another box. So this is my runway. And yeah, I'll just have to draw some lines. So these are the piano keys. Oh, this is going to be ugly. These are the piano keys at the beginning of the runway. We'll say that this is runway one three. Uh, and I've got a series of marks on the runway. So I've got a pair of really short ones right here. And then I got another pair of short ones right here. And then I got a pair of really big guys down here. These first group of markings, these are your 500 foot markings. The second short markings are your 1000 foot markings. And the beginning of these markers here are your 1300 foot markers. So when we are uh, doing a, a two engine approach and landing, we're always trying to aim to touch down right at the beginning of these big white marks. Now, forgive my drawing here, it's not the greatest, but we're aiming, that's where our touchdown point is going to be, or at least that's when the landing gear should be touching the runway. But we recall that the aircraft is going to flare, you know, it's gonna float a little bit in the landing flare, and this aircraft generally flares about 500 feet. So the place that I'm actually going to be aiming for for my touchdown is right around here, around the 800 foot markers. So if I aim at 800 feet on the approach and I bring my throttles idle and ease back and float the aircraft a little bit, it should touch down right around the 1300 foot markers. Uh, on the flight test guide, the uh, tolerances for the uh, maneuver, uh, you can be up to 100 feet short and up to 300 feet long. So obviously longer is better. You don't wanna be short. So you can, if you need to add just a touch of power to get yourself within the uh, the area. The one thing I will tell you about the uh, the tolerances and the way that they mark on the flight test guide is that if you are exactly bang on the 1300 foot markers right as the paint begins, that's a four out of four, as long, and I should say, as long as it's a controlled smooth landing. If you're floating high and you see those 1300 foot markers start to come underneath you, don't shove that nose down because that's an automatic fail, right? It still has to be a normal landing on the main landing gear. If need be, I'd rather have a landing float long and be gentle as opposed to one where I, I slam in hard. Uh, if you slam in hard, that's an automatic one. If you float long, it's a major error, but it still might be a pass. So uh, the way that this is marked is that if you touch down under control smoothly at exactly the, the beginning of the 1300 foot markers, that is a four out of four. If you stay within this minus 100 to three plus 300 feet uh, box, that is a three out of four. But you can actually, on the flight test guide, you can double these tolerances. The way that they mark is that if you go... Uh, you can go, I should say, um, like that. You can go minus 200 feet up to plus 600 feet. Uh, that would still be within acceptable limits, but is a major error. 
So they can double the tolerances is how you can look at that. As long as you're within double tolerances, it's a major error, but you still pass. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. And uh, actually, and as far as the flight test guide goes, the way they mark it is that as long as you don't get any ones, that's a pass, unless you get an abundance of twos. Uh, if you have five twos, or I should say more than five twos, that would be considered a fail and you have to redo the flight test. If you get uh, five twos or less, that's a pass. I mean, it's not great, but it's good. And if you get um, uh, one one or two ones, that's considered a partial. Uh, on the flight test guide, which means that you'll have to go up and repractice that specific exercise, but uh, you don't have to redo the flight test. If you get three ones, then that is a fail and you'll have to redo the whole thing. And you know, it does happen, but uh, you practice and uh, we get ourselves through it. But those are the tolerances for the normal landing. So minus 100 feet plus 300. Again, this is if you have both engines operating, if you're doing a single engine approach and landing, we only use flaps 25, 105 miles per hour, and we don't care where you touch down as long as it's within the, about the first third of the runway. Uh, that's pretty much all I want to talk about for the, the multi-flying uh, guys. If you do have any questions, uh, by all means, feel free to come to me or your instructor at any time. We'll, uh, we'll help you out. And if you have any questions with regards to the, uh, the flight test itself, don't forget you can always look at the flight test um, uh, guide, which has more details. Other than that, guys, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, good luck, and I hope you have a good night.